I'm going to start with a quote from a dead white guy, Plato. There's a quote in which he says, the world's not going to be in good shape until, get this, philosophers become kings and kings become philosophers. Now, you might think that as a philosopher, I, I really like that statement, <laughs> right? Because I should be a king. But I'm a huge fan of democracy, huge fan of democracy. Plato, however, was not at all a fan of democracy. It's not like he thought it was the worst form of government, but he did think it was the second worst form of government. The only thing worse is absolute tyranny where you're ruled by a, uh, a despot. Uh, he compared democracy, uh, the democratic state, to a ship at sea. It's beset by a bunch of sailors. The sailors are fighting with each other, and the sailors each have one overriding goal, to somehow get the owner of the ship, that would be the people, to uh, hand over the rudder of the ship to them. Not because they know anything about na navigation, but because they want to plunder the ship. That's what he thought of politicians in a democracy. Now you might think, well, the politicians, yeah, who likes politicians? Plato also did not think much of the people. <laughs> he compared the people to a uh, beast moved by appetite and passion rather than reason. And here's what he said about the art of political persuasion in a democracy. Trying to persuade the people in a democracy is trying to wrestle and sue this savage beast. Right. And that's not reason. That's not reason discourse. That's just manipulation and persuasion. Now, here's something I would really like to believe. I would like to believe that Plato got it absolutely wrong about democracy. I would like to believe that. But you know what? I don't. And neither did our founding fathers, so I've got a problem, <laughs> right? And if I ask Plato's question, are human beings fit for, for self-governance, rational self-governance, either individually or collectively, he'll say, no, look at the human mind. Most humans are not fit, only an elite few are, and so democracy is completely unworkable. Think that's a terrible argument? I think it's a troubling argument. So I said, I want to defend democracy. I'm here, I'm here to defend democracy, but I'm going to make it harder. Because uh, I'm going to show you modern cognitive science. So we're going from Plato to 2,500 years ago to modern cognitive science. One thing modern cognitive science does is it's probed the mind a great deal. It's probed the human mind a great deal. And one of the things that it's found is that the human mind is shot through with irrationality in its belief formation and in its de uh, decision making. All kinds of irrationalities. Here's one kind of irrationality. It's called an endowment effects. And it actually, it affects both goods, it, uh, it has to do with both goods and, uh, and, and beliefs. Basically, the idea of an endowment effect is if you have something, or if you believe something, you'll place greater value on the thing that you have than a thing that you could get that's equivalent. Like I said, that applies to both good, uh, goods and beliefs. I could, do, I could do a little thought experiment. Suppose I were to give this half of the room a, a cool thing, a plaque, a cup, whatever. And I said, it's yours to keep. You can have it. And I'm going to say, this half of the room, I'm going to give you uh, the same cool thing, but only if you're willing to pay the price. You pay the right price. I ask you, what price you're willing to pay? You'll write down a price. I'll ask you guys, what price are you willing to sell your cool thing to them for? You're going to set a price like twice as high as the price that they'll that they'll be willing to buy it. Why? Because you got it. It doesn't just apply to uh, uh, goods, it also applies to beliefs. People fall in love with their beliefs. There's a phenomenon that, uh, that, because it was uh, discovered by some Canadians, and they talk funny, it's called perseverance of discredited, discredited belief rather than perseverance of discredited beliefs. So here's, a, here's I'm going to do a little experiment. I'm going to ask you to base, uh, form a belief based on some evidence. Do risk takers or cautious people make better firefighters. I'm gonna give this side the following evidence. There's a, there's a John, the risk-taking firefighter. He rushes into a burning building, puts himself at great risk, but in the process saves a family from death. What do you think? Do risk-taking people or, or, or cautious people make better firefighters? Group A, you're gonna conclude, oh, risk-taking people make better firefighters because you're gonna say something like, oh, being a firefighter takes courage. And look at, look at, look at, and, 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 and so you, you got to be brave. Okay, group B, I'm going to give you a different story. I'm going to say, look, John, the cautious fighter fire, decides it's too risky to allow his unit to enter the burning building. 
which immediately after it's, uh, it collapses, the whole thing is engulfed in uh, flames and smoke. If he had sent his guys in there, they would have died. Group B says, oh, cautious people uh, make better firefighters because you've got to have good judgment. Now, here's the problem, though. It's all a setup. And I'm going to now debrief you. I'm going to say, you know what? I just made that all up. It's all a setup. I was just playing with you. But you know what? You think you're going to change your mind about what you believe on the basis of this discrediting evidence? No chance. You're going to hold on to what you believe. Right? You're, even though the evidence on which you base your belief is completely discredited, you still believe it. You think that's rational? No way. <laughs> we make bad decisions. We're really averse to loss. We're averse to losing goods. We're averse to losing, uh, uh, to, to losing our cherished beliefs. Uh, that's about beliefs you already had. Suppose I wanted to seek out a belief. Sometimes you have to seek out a belief. And uh, you, know, you have to decide what to believe. And to decide what to believe, you form a hypothesis and you test it. So I'm going to give you a little test. Here's a hypothesis. Is this hypothesis true or false? If a card has a vowel on one side, then it has an even number on the other. And what I want you to do, I want you to name those cards and only those cards which you should turn over to d determine whether this hypothesis is true or false. Solve the problem in your head. You all got it? How many of you said e, the E card and the 7 card? How many of you said that? Everybody who didn't say E and 7 got this little problem wrong. How many of you thought the 7 is irrelevant here? How many of you wanted to turn over the 7? Not very many. You know why? You wanted, probably all wanted to turn over the E. If you wanted to turn over the K and the 4, I don't know what to do with you. But if you wanted... <laughs> If you wanted to turn over the E, you wanted to turn over the E because you think, well, if there's a, uh, uh, an even number on there, that confirms the hypothesis. But what you didn't notice, that if you turn over the 7 and there's an e, uh, a vowel on that, that disconfirms the hypothesis. So what we do when we're testing hypotheses, we seek out confirmation. You say, is this a big deal? Yeah, it's a big deal. It's called confirmation bias. It's all around us. It's one of the main human cognitive failings. And people know this. People know, the media knows this, the politicians know this, the marketers know this. Uh, Fox News' business model is based on confirmation bias. <laughs> Nobody ever watches fo Fox News looking to have their uh, preconceived notions uh, refuted. But you know what? MSNBC knows it too, right? We, we've given ourselves uh, internet cocoons. Look, so we got Plato's right. The human mind is a mess. What do we do about it? Do we turn over the art of government to the philosophical elite, the technocratic elite, the scientific elite, and forget the sh poor schmucks down there who are the rest of us? Should we do that? Some say yes. <laughs> I, s I say no. I say no. I say if Plato had a half-right solution, he was, he was partly there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change that quote of his. The war, there will be no end to the troubles of states or indeed of humanity itself till philosophers become citizens in this world, or here's the real thing, or till those we now call citizens and the people really and truly become philosophers. Why do I say that? Why was Plato such a fan of the philosopher kings? Because the philosophy is about making your mind, disciplining your mind, so that A, it seeks truth and only truth always, and B, it's always and only moved by the force of the better reason. You want to you wanna persuade me of something? Give me a better reason. Now, this capacity to be moved by the force of the better reason, to be an inveterate truth seeker who questions everything, even their own preconceived notions and who aren't subject to confirmation bias, this capacity, I believe, is essential to the workings of a shared life in a democratic polity. We should regard it as the birthright, the birthright, of every child born in a democracy. Without it, without that, Plato is right. Democracy cannot work. You have the elite, the intelligentsia, ruling on behalf of and over the rest of us. And I do not think that would be a good thing. So we got to get the humanities going, and philosophy in particular. Thank you.